For me, the best part of my Real Vision journey has been the chance to refine my own investment framework through a series of conversations with brilliant investors in every corner of the globe. In this series, I want to try and continue my education by digging deeper into the lives and careers of my guests to try and learn how they think. I want to understand the experiences that have shaped them, the failures they've bounced back from, and the lessons that those failures have taught them. And I want to break down their success to find out what sets them apart. I'm not looking for trade ideas or guesses about an unknowable future, but rather knowledge accumulated over the course of careers to try and make me a better investor. And I want to share those conversations with you. career in the investment industry is arguably the ultimate learning process. The early formative days are when temperaments and character are forged and the environment in which we cut our teeth will define and shape a career path without us even realizing it. In those early days we watch and learn, taking cues from the wiser, more experienced heads around us as our confidence develops until we feel ready to make bold calls of our own. Occasionally however, the industry finds itself graced with young professionals whose self-confidence and singularity of purpose allow them to make bold predictions about the future and, often against the wishes of those wiser, more experienced heads, to back those predictions with actions that produce extraordinary results. Today, I'm traveling to Naples, Florida to meet one such man. From the earliest days of his 40-year career, he's made a series of big, contrarian calls which consistently identified both market tops and bottoms, and he's developed a reputation for having the courage to act on those calls in ways which leave the majority of investors dumbstruck. A member of the Barons Roundtable for 30 years, he now manages his own family office and consults for some of the world's biggest investment institutions. But today, he's kindly invited me to his home to walk through the defining moments of his career in search of lessons. So please join me for a conversation with Felix Zulauf. Felix, thank you so much for having us. It's such a pleasure to finally meet you. You and I have chatted over the years, uh, over email, but to finally sit here in person is a, is a real treat. So thanks for, thanks for having us. Well, thank you very much for coming to uh, my place here in Naples. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. We have known each other for many years, but never met in never person. Met. That's this exactly is the right. first time. That's exactly right. It's great. So, so it's great to get the chance to sit and talk. You know, what I want to do today is, is walk through your storied career and, and just pick some of the highlights along the way because I'm really interested in, in some of the big calls you've made and, and I guess more importantly how you made them and, and, and some of the early ones how you had the confidence to make them because you were a young man uh, who like me didn't do the whole college thing you know, we got thrust into this thing at an early age. I traded uh, for my own uh, little money of course, uh, made all the mistakes you make at the beginning with my own money, which really hurts, but teaches you a lesson. Sure. I wanted to go to a stockbroker, and that's where I ended up. I spent one year in Paris, and the stockbroker, the owner, made me a salesman immediately. That was kind of nice, because all of a sudden, after one month, I earned about 20 times as much as <laughs> I earned as an intern, you know? <laughs> And I had a good life. I knew all the good restaurants in Paris and the nightclubs and all that. I was 23 years old. And uh, I met a gentleman, an English. What we're showing you here on our YouTube channel is just the tip of the iceberg. No matter where you are in your financial journey, whether you're a beginner just looking to break into the market or a financial professional looking to up your game, Real Vision has something for everyone. Every day, our team of expert journalists provides in-depth analysis, written reports, access to live streams, and access to our community, The Exchange, where you can interact with people just like you from all over the world. For just $1, you can unlock all of this and more at realvision.com. Try our essential tier. If you like what you see, it's only 20 bucks a month thereafter. So click on the link in the description, go to realvision.com, and see what you think. We look forward to seeing you there. You know... And I had a good life. I knew all the good restaurants in Paris and the nightclubs and all that. I was 23 years old. And uh, I met a gentleman, an Englishman, uh, who taught me a lot about uh, the business. Um, he was a chart, uh, a chartist. A technician, yeah. Technician. 
and I learned the technical analysis and I learned, um, I, I read a lot about cycles, business cycles, stock market cycles. And I came to the conclusion that the market uh, is ready to head down. And this and was now, where are we now? This was in uh, summer of 1973. Okay. And uh, at the same time, the owner of uh, the company said to me, I should play with my own money. And I said, I do, but I don't have enough. Uh, and, uh, and he said, how much do you need? And I said, uh, half a million. At that time, that was a lot of money. Well, yeah, I was going to say, you know, for a 23-year-old. Uh, yeah. and, and he lent me that uh, half million, and I uh, built up my short positions in the market. And then was that uh, huge rally, bear market rally, yeah. from summer 1973 into, I think, late 73 it was. Uh, and all the nifty 50 stocks, the high growth stocks, they rallied strongly, and it almost killed me. I mean, I was a smoker at that time. I gave up a few years later, but I was a smoker at that time, and I smoked about two um, <laughs> packs of um, Goloise Bleu uh, without filter. That's real at cigarettes, that time. yeah. The real cigarettes. And in the trading room at the Paris Stock Exchange, everybody was smoking. You know, we were trading and smoking sure. at the same time. And uh, so I had to learn to trade out of my risks, but keeping my positions. Yeah. You know, and uh, it, it learned me a lesson. I, um, I, I went through a difficult period, but then uh, the oil shock hit. Then well, hang on. I, 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 let's come back to this, because there's, there's so much in this that I, I want to dig into if we can. I, we'll come back to the oil shock in a minute. Okay. But I'm, I'm fascinated at this idea that here you are, 23 years old, and someone gives you half a million dollars to play with on the short side of the market. Well, he didn't say what I should use for. No, I no, decided no. Right. that it was the short side. But presumably, at some point, he came and said, so, you know, how are you investing this half a million dollars? I mean, that's, that, that, they're two huge decisions for someone to have that confidence in you. Well, you know, at that time, when you look back, when you look back, the European markets peaked in the early 1960s. Mm -hmm. And all there was was a down cycle, an up cycle, a down cycle, an up going sideways yeah. since the early 60s. Uh, the US stock market peaked in 68 on a breast basis. And there were a few stocks, the nifty 50s, that carried it on to minor new highs in the early uh, 70s. But, but that was it. So I was always used to play short and long. Yeah. It didn't matter to me because I grew up in my younger years watching the market, playing the market with that sideways yeah. cyclical swings. Uh, so for me, being long or short at that time didn't matter. So, so it wasn't such a big... Because today, when you think about it, yeah. for the last 30 years, to, to play the market on the short side, to me, is the hardest thing to do. And really, you've only, been, you've only had the chance to be really right maybe four or five times in the last 25 years. So it just seems like such a big decision, but I guess when you put it well, in context... Well, it was a big thing then. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was nerve-wracking. Uh, I was um, staying up uh, long nights um, and, and, and working through my analysis and doing all that stuff. And um, I was not always sleeping well. Uh, you know, I, I realized when my positions uh, became too big uh, and I had to shower twice a night uh, right. that I had to reduce my risk, right. Right. of course. So uh, I, learned to, I learned to manage uh, my risks uh, the hard way. And... Uh, <clears throat> And, and finally, it worked out very well for me because usually in the later stages of a cycle, there are things happening that are surprising the majority of investors. Yes. But they are usual the norm late in the cycle. You have interest rates going up, inflation going up, you have central banks tightening and all that stuff. And then in the later stages, you have commodities rising or whatever. And then we had the oil shock. It was the first time that uh, OPEC was founded and they put the price up yeah. of oil from $2.50 to 12 uh, or something like that. And, uh, and of course, that was a huge tax on the world economy. And that really pushed the world economy over into the serious recession of 1974. And all those stock prices uh, were cut in half or more. Yeah. And, um, and I had a good time. Yeah, yeah I well, had a good time. <laughs> Cashed in and, uh, and, and, and thought, 
maybe I know now, uh, but uh, uh, that probably also lent me a skeptical bias yeah. uh, in my whole career. So I'm a cycle guy and I'm a skeptical guy because I know from my experience what goes up comes down. You know, well, this, this is why you and I get on so well, because I'm exactly the same. I, I believe in cycles and I'm enormously skeptical. Uh, about pretty much everything. And I get more so as I get older, unfortunately, <laughs> which is not necessarily great, but it's just the way it is. But w when you talk about you learn to manage those risks and you learn to manage the, the stress that comes at those positions, apart from showering twice a night, how did you, how did you do that? Because I guess it's, we all learn at some point that it's about getting the, your position size correct. Because if you have the position the right size, generally you can manage these swings much better. But how did you learn to deal with that, that stress of being on the wrong side of the market for a period of time? Well, obviously, you learn then that uh, within a primary trend, there are intermediate-term trends. And within an intermediate-term trend, there are short-term swings. And you learn to observe that. And then you know when you have two big positions and you have to cut back, you try to cut back at the ideal point in the short-term swing not at the wrong point yeah. in the short term. Usually people do exactly the opposite because they are forced to cut back. Uh, I, I did that also wrong at the very beginning, but learned by observing and, uh, and, uh, and then applying it. And, and, and that's the whole secret. And yeah, what do you yeah. look for? What, what, what are the signals that you look for so you know where you are in those cycles? Well, at that time, you didn't have a lot of indicators. Yeah. You had some oscillators. You had some uh, on-balance volume uh, indicators, um, uh, uh, some momentum indicators. But you didn't have a lot of sentiment indicators. It was much more how this or that guy you knew yes. and who was always wrong in the market, right. you know, uh, how he reacts and behaves, and you do the opposite. <laughs> but of course, you you widen your perspective and you look a little bit broader. And I listen to older people uh, uh, who were wiser, um, maybe smarter, knew more. Uh, but I didn't have sentiment indicators at yeah. that time. Now, today we have a variety of indicators, and we probably have too many. Uh, so that you do not know which one you should rely on. Sure. See, but th this, this idea of being contrarian in nature, I yeah. find fascinating because I feel that way too. You know, I, I, I feel as though when markets are just so frothy and going one way, the easy money is always going to be made going the other way. But you have to have the patience. You have to have the ability to withstand being wrong for a period of time. And in, in your business, you have to have clients and investors who are willing to back you and, and, have, and have faith in you. How do you build that kind of position? Is it, is it simply by being right more often than not over time? I, I think it's um, um, several things. Uh, first of all, it's a, a certain track record that you have built uh, over time. Uh, secondly, it is how you explain what you do. Uh, you have to educate your clients. Uh, you have to tell them why you turn bullish and why you turn bearish and what you are looking for. And uh, you have to tell them honestly where you made mistake yeah. uh, and, uh, and inform that when you made a mistake. And then you educate your investors and they understand and they understand that you are a human being who makes decisions and not all the decisions are right. Uh, they are probably half of the decisions that are wrong. And, and it, it's an educational process you, you go through. And, and uh, as a money manager running other people's money, uh, which I'm not anymore, I'm, I'm, I'm only running my own money uh, now, uh, I, I informed all investors with a letter. Every month I sent out a letter explaining what we thought is happening and where it would take us and how we position ourselves and what that would mean and where we had to change our position if this and that happened. Yeah. So it's sort of a guideline. And that creates and builds confidence over time. It's interesting because you know, t today, um, it's so much easier to communicate with people. And yet, that, that kind of private communication to your investors gives you the ability to be open and honest about mistakes you might have made and, and lessons you've learned. 
Whereas today, people seem almost afraid to do that because the court of public opinion is so big now. And if you have made a mistake, you tend to get called out on it in the media and you know, people talk about, oh, how could you get that wrong? It, it, you know, it seems to me as though the business of money management is getting harder and, and in fact it's kind of straying from what it really is all about. It's more like public relations now than managing money. The nature of the business has changed dramatically and, um, and that is also due to the huge interventions and manipulations by the authorities. You know, in the past, uh, we had a normal business cycle and the interventions were just at the low level. I mean, they, uh, they created easy money, they created fiscal push, but it was all within limits and you knew what would happen as a next step in the cycle. It was all uh, sort of in a written script yeah. uh, uh, in, in a cycle. Today, in the current cycle, it's very different. You know, we saw things that we never thought possible 20 years ago. And uh, the degree of intervention and manipulation is enormous. Obviously, the authorities mean that they should take all the possible pain away and manage the short term and the business cycle. And by doing that, they weaken the structure of our uh, system, of our um, uh, economic fabric, uh, so to speak. And this is changing things, and it has also changed the investment and investment styles in that more quantitative um, analysis uh, have taken over. Uh, the judgmental uh, analysis uh, is out. Um, uh, a trend following and technical analysis is completely um, uh, disrespected. Uh, and, uh, and it's all algorithms and quantitative numbers, computer models, etc. Et and I think this goes to an extreme, and I think we are already at an extreme. And once an excess is being built, you know, then it backfires. Then it goes to the other end. And I think the next bear cycle will probably show that those acrobats with algorithms will do very poorly. Yeah. And that the judgmental approach uh, and, and those who know how to judge a cycle and the market, um, uh, a financial market cycle will probably do very well. So I think uh, some of the uh, hedge fund managers that are now uh, uh, derated yes. in our industry uh, will probably come back with very good returns when the currently highly respected and praised uh, quant uh, acrobats uh, will be uh, downgraded yes, uh, yeah. a lot. So, uh, so I, I think it goes through cycles itself. Let's get back to, to your career and, and back to that, that mid to late 70s period when you, you cashed in, um, you, you got that cycle right, you cashed in. Um, what do you do now? At that time, uh, I was running only my own, my own money and, uh, and not the bank's money. So they didn't know uh, about ah, all okay. those things. They didn't know. Uh, but of course, they noticed that my self-confidence was on the rise. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing worse than a young self-confident uh, trader. You know, and, and I think uh, if you enter the market, you need um, a high degree of self-confidence because if you don't, you hesitate all the time. Yeah. And if you hesitate, you are always one step behind. And being one step behind can be very costly. Uh, so I think uh, uh, they realized uh, what I was doing in the late 70s. Uh, I had in between, I, had, um, I stayed in uh, New York for a year and a half. And I uh, put together a trading program for myself and I trained with the best of the best uh, uh, because I asked to be with Ed Hyman in economics or Bob Farrell in market uh, analysis or Stanley Shopcon in trading at Solomon Brothers. Right. And because the Swiss bank was a large commission producer, yeah. you know, I, I got all those permissions. So I, I really met the best of the best in Wall Street, and it was fantastic. It was like a little kid first time in a candy store, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and when I came back, my head was full of ideas, 
And then I arranged that UBS bought me out. Okay. You, you see, I think I was the first uh, buyout, uh, right. <laughs> so to speak. Uh, and I uh, managed their U.S. equity fund, a, a public mutual fund, okay. which performed very well uh, over the years. And then uh, in 1980, I was given the responsibility also for a commodity-related equity fund. And uh, it was right at the top of the commodity yep. cycle. And I came to the conclusion this is the top of the commodity cycle. So what do you do with an equity fund for commodity-related equities, energy and raw materials, etc. And I looked through the uh, rules and regulations of that, uh, the bylaws of that fund, and I saw that I could also invest in bonds of companies in those fields, in those industries. And I put 70% of the fund into those um, uh, bonds <laughs> because I saw bond yields at the peak and coming down and uh, 30% in cash. And uh, it took about three months or so. And then the supervisory body of uh, Swiss banks uh, pulled up and said, what the hell are you guys <laughs> right. doing? Right. <laughs> and um, my very senior boss uh, was very nervous, but my boss in between, he backed me, he defended me. Uh, he was um, uh, known for uh, cycle analysis business cycle analysis, and he believes that too, that the cycle will turn down. So uh, the supervisory authority said, you know, if you're wrong, you will get an angry letter from us and we will punish you. Right. And we said, and, and what if we are right? And he said, then you won't hear from us. So we didn't hear from them right. anymore. Uh, it was the top of uh, the commodity cycle and it went all down. Uh, and then in the early 80s, I was a raging bull. You know, at that time, when you go back, uh, money market rates were sky high, near 20%. Uh, bond yields for 10-year treasuries were 15% or something like that. And the customer people of the banks and the money managers, they were placing their clients' money right there in the money market, yeah. where it was easy without risk. You could Oof. earn a very good return. Uh, of course, inflation was higher than it is today, but still. And, and I saw that the market was dirt cheap. You could buy uh, great stocks, blue chip stocks, at um, P.E. ratios that were lower than the dividend Six, yield. Seven, I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Lower yeah. than the dividend yield. Yeah. You know, you could buy Unilever uh, or, or stocks like that at uh, just fantastic prices. And I was uh, put in charge in the meantime of global... Uh, strategy at the bank uh, besides managing money and uh, I was pounding the table and I went through the bank and nobody listened so I was the raging bull at the bank and then the bull market really took off and uh, was a decent run and in uh, 1987 uh, I wanted to cut back I thought uh, we have gone to an extreme uh, that was about it and we have to cut back and I was a member of the investment committee and I convinced my colleagues to cut back and we um, cut back and then we were uh, uh, overruled by general management. And that really provoked me. And I thought, what do you guys know about the market? We right. do your job, right. we do our right. job. And they provoked me to such a degree that I said, over the next six months, we go down by 25% and I make an example. You know, I want to prove that what we are saying is right. So I ordered all my portfolio managers to go to zero equities, which was, right, well, right. Which, which was just an extreme call. I think nobody ever did it before and, and, and after. And, um, and today, at the more seasoned age, I would probably not go no. to such an extreme, but I was an aggressive guy. And we went to zero and we were selling every day in the market. And at the same time, UBS had a capital raise, an increase of capital. And we were selling UBS stocks too, which was not pleasantly received, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and so the battle was going on in September uh, of 87. There was the UBS finance seminar where they invite about 30 uh, 
uh, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies from all over the world. And I had two spots. Uh, one was one hour theory in portfolio management and the other hour practice. You know, what's the current assessment? And I, uh, and I told them, you know, next six months, it's 25% down in the markets. Uh, it looks bad. And I explained it, everything. And when I arrived back in my office, this was on the countryside in the training center of UBS. And when I arrived uh, at the Zurich office, my secretary said, uh, you have a phone call from the general management. You should go and see them immediately. <laughs> so I knew what was coming and uh, he blamed me and uh, he said, you are uh, telling nonsense to our prime customers and things like that. And I said, this is, not no, this is no nonsense. This is serious analysis. And I have done my homework and you should trust me, you know. Right. <laughs> and anyway, they blamed me even in front of my whole team. They blamed me, which I hated. Uh, you can imagine. I yeah, was uh, 37 and uh, I thought I knew what was going on in the world, etc. cetera. And, and then the crash happened. <clears throat> and uh, of course, I knew... I, I was right, but my career was over because it was so extreme. What happened was so extreme. I didn't expect that it would all happen in one day. One day, day of course. In the US, it happened in one day. In Europe, it, it lasted one month. It continued yeah. to go down for one month. And it was down about 40% or so. Uh, I knew my career was over. Uh, so I handed in my resignation and cashed in all my shorts. There'll be people listening to this that hear you talk about instructing all your managers to go to 0% equities, and they'll be rewinding that just to make sure, did he really say 0% equities? You know, because that's something, I mean, you could not do that today. Maybe an individual yeah. hedge fund could, but I mean, an institutional money manager? Yeah, no but I, I, had some, I had some who were not happy about that and didn't feel comfortable, but uh, uh, twice a week, I had a morning meeting with my whole team and the professional money managers. I explained step by step why I came to that conclusion and what I expected to happen and what we do now and what the next steps were and where our stops were and what we had to do if our stops were hit and our strategy was proven wrong. Yeah. You know, I, I explained all that. I didn't do it just in the dark. No, room. no, of course. Uh, so it was all explained, laid out that they understood. Uh, Unfortunately, general management didn't want to listen to it, you know. But I understand them now much better than then because they had a business risk. Of course. They had a business risk. And, uh, and today at my age and knowing what I know today, I would probably not go to the same extreme. So, I mean, has, is money management now, do you think, an old man's game? Has it changed? Because your point was, was spot on that, that it, when you're young, you have the confidence, you don't have fear, but it feels as though all the risk now is business risk in money management. Yes. It's reputational risk, it's business yes. risk. So have we lost that ability for young, smart, hungry investors to actually follow their convictions? No, I think the young, uh, smart and hungry investors are still there, but they are a different breed. They are quants. Right. Today, they are quants. In the old days, they were trader-like, you know, like the Paul Tudor Joneses uh, yeah. of, of this world and the Stanley Druckermillers, George Soros. Uh, uh, those styles are out today completely because there is a high degree of uh, personal judgment involved, which is not tolerated anymore yeah. in today's world. Uh, so I think the young, smart people today are the quants and they are very smart and they are very good but as we didn't know then everything we should have known they do not know everything now as they should know you see and they run at some point they run into some pro they will run into some problems yeah. and they will be uh, um, educated by the market eventually uh, it just takes a little bit longer than it did uh, in our years. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, you know, I find this fascinating because it, everything now is predicated upon liquidity. You know, the, the, the quants function on liquidity and they've been used to having excess liquidity. As the quants have grown, 
so has central bank involvement in markets, okay. and that, that is liquidity. And so I, I, you know, my worry when, when this cycle turns or tries to turn again is this sudden withdrawal of liquidity, which is going to throw just about every modern day investment strategy into real crisis. Yes, and uh, that brings up a good, uh, a good point, because if that happens, I believe that our authorities would intervene like never before. I think they would buy every asset they need to buy to stabilize the system. So again, I think the current cycle we are in is a new era uh, in, in the way our authorities intervene in a free market system. So the free market system is not the free market system anymore. It's a managed system. And we are moving more and more to a government controlled market and away from a free market system. If we continue to do that, and once you have started this, you can hardly go back. Yes. And, and if we continue to do that, which I assume we will, uh, then it means that prosperity on a broad basis will decline and it will be uh, uh, very detrimental for the broad public in our societies. Felix's formative years in what was a heavily cyclical market were influential in his having the confidence to bet on changes in direction, a skill that anyone who began their career in the last quarter of a century will simply not have been taught by the markets. His understanding that investors need constant communication and to be educated about how he manages their money also seems to be something of a lost art. But it was his putting 70% of his commodity fund into bonds and the other 30% in cash and his call to go to 0% equity weighting in 1987 that hit me like a ton of bricks. Not only were they brave in the extreme, but they were the kinds of actions that would no longer be allowed in modern day money management. And if Felix's thoughts about the likely effect on society when central banks are next called upon to act are correct, such drastic actions will be necessary in order to preserve capital. So after 1987, when you cashed your chips in you, you mentioned uh, earlier that your career was over. And to many people, that will come as a surprise. Perhaps you could just explain exactly what you meant by that, because obviously it was the, the end of something, but the beginning of something completely different. Well, um, my career at uh, UBS, at the bank, uh, was over because uh, the general manager uh, looked bad uh, in yeah. my eyes. And, uh, and we were in a fight and uh, he lost and I won. Uh, so he would never promote me again. Sure. Uh, and he would, do, um, he, he would probably not, my, not make my life easier. Uh, let's put it that way. So I decided I, uh, I, I go... I go on and uh, look for another job. I was playing with the idea of going on and start my own company. It was a difficult time the first two years uh, until uh, the business got started. And, uh, and I, I know what it is like when you fear about your economic uh, existence, mm -hmm. you know. There are fears and, uh, and my wife and I, we have gone through that. And, uh, we didn't know how to um, how we would uh, be successful, etc. And all of a sudden, it started, and I became successful. Uh, the company was making uh, good money, uh, and then in um, the mid '90s, I didn't want to have individual portfolios anymore. Uh, I had large uh, clients, I had institutional clients, mm -hmm. and things like that. Uh, I decided that I wanted to make my life easier, and decided to. Um, put them all together in a fund and I started a long short fund but no leverage uh, where I could play primarily European equities but I could also play some currencies and things like that but the main theme was European equities and uh, we did very well uh, then we started uh, around 2000, 2002 we started a commodity related fund because we thought there was a new commodity cycle uh, coming, uh, which was ve doing very well. I ran a fund for um, Mary Lynch, for the Mary Lynch uh, family. Uh, they gave me a platform and, that, and they said, you go around to all the offices around the world 
and we don't do any marketing for you, you have to do it yourself. So I went around and within uh, two and a half years, I raised a billion, which at that time was a was lot of real money. money. Yeah, sure. Uh, so we became successful and uh, in the uh, mid 2000s, we managed about two and a half billion dollars. Uh, and we did that with a total staff of seven people. Uh, so I, I think, uh, and we had the classic hedge fund uh, uh, performance charges and, uh, and flat fee charges, which were very high. So we had a good business and we made a lot of money. We were happy, uh, but I became exhausted uh, because at the end of the day, everything was depending on me. Yeah. Uh, whenever I was away, something went wrong. And uh, I had good people, but they had more an eight to five job, or they considered it that way. So I thought, that's it. I have to get out of it because my father died when he was 50 and I was uh, just about 50 and I became exhausted. So I, I left the company. Uh, we decided all that in 2006 or so. It took on until 2009, until everything was uh, made different and I turned uh, the shelf of the company into my family office and uh, and uh, I run in that family office I run my own capital my own uh, money and I also uh, publish like you do uh, because I love uh, the game and I love analyzing the world uh, from politics and geopolitics uh, down to the macro uh, interest rates, currencies, um, uh, equities, commodities, and I write about that about every two every two weeks. Uh, it keeps me busy. My wife is a little bit disappointed. <laughs> uh, uh, she always thought that I would retire at some point, but uh, she has understood that in this business you cannot retire. You can't, particularly the, when you have you, you, you have you money cannot. at stake. So, but, let, but let, for now, let's go back to. Uh, the next big turning point in markets, which was 99, the, the, the dot-com bubble. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm interested in your experiences there, because that was that one, even even the non-Felix Zulafs of the world saw that one coming. Yeah. So, so how, how did that whole thing play out through your eyes? Um, we were early, as, we, uh, uh, as I'm usually are, I'm, I'm usually early. You, you see, the dot-com bubble really started with the Asian crisis. Mm -hmm. The Asian crisis uh, started in 97. Seven, yeah. And uh, the market broke down badly in 98. And, uh, and that was actually very interesting because that mini crash in 98, I didn't lose any money in my long only portfolios. And we made a ton of money in the long short portfolios because we were uh, long yen and short dollars. Uh, that was the trade that hurt uh, Julian Robertson yes. pretty, pretty badly. And, and I think, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, Julian and I, we were talking on the phone a few weeks before that. And I told him, uh, I, I think the dollar will weaken and the yen will strengthen. And it was a sort of a collapse of the dollar because dollar yen went within two weeks I think from 145 or so to about 110 or 108 yeah. or something like that. Crazy move, crazy move. And, uh, and we made a lot of money because we were on the right side of the trade through options, foreign exchange options. So we, we, we play all sorts of markets, uh, always. Yeah. And, uh, and that really was a big kick uh, to the Merrill Lynch account because that account didn't lose any money when that mini crash happened and and they thought I could walk on water, <laughs> uh, which I guarantee you I cannot. <laughs> and, uh, and the money was just flowing in like crazy. And then came Alan Greenspan who opened the floodgates uh, because of uh, LTCM. Yes. You know, the LTCM broke uh, out. Uh, uh, that was a, a serious crisis uh, going on and he flooded the system and the market took off again, and particularly the TMT, uh, Telecom, Tech, Media, media and, tele and, yeah. and, and Telecom, Technology. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they went to uh, sky-high valuations. It was crazy, and it was a bubble, and I was waiting for it to break. And uh, you can read uh, the Barron's Roundtable of uh, January 
uh, 2000, uh, where I um, recommended to go short NASDAQ uh, because of that. And I laid it out, it was all clear. I wasn't short before, but I was, not, I was underweight technology on the move up, uh, which was a little bit of a problem. Uh, but I had built in so much performance during the yep. crash before that it really didn't hurt. But, but for your self-confidence, it's, it's never... It's never pleasant uh, when you are running behind the market. Uh, so I made plenty of mistakes, uh, believe me. And, uh, and then we went short uh, uh, the TMT sector, and that was working out very well. The market went down, our fund was going up, uh, uh, just about the same uh, angle <laughs> on yeah. the chart. Uh, and we did very well, and they brought us more money, and uh, we were very successful. That was the downturn. I, Usually when I look back in all the downturns, uh, I was doing very well because I'm, I think I'm a good risk manager because I hate to lose money. I come, my background is uh, a middle class family. Uh, we didn't have um, a lot of money at home. Um, uh, so whatever you gain and what you earn, you try to preserve. Sure. And I think that is deep. Uh, in my genes that uh, preserve what you got and therefore I rather lose some opportunities on the upside but I don't want to get hurt on the downside. So I, I play the downside always better than I played the upside. Uh, on the upside everybody is uh, a hero yeah. um, but on the downside that's where it really counts whether you lose big or not. Let's go back to your own firm and you're managing other people's money. You know, how did you find that different when, it, when it's, it's other people's money, but you're, it's not through UBS? This is, this is Zula from Co. This is your business, your name above the door, and you're suddenly responsible personally for other people's money. Did that change the way you, you, you invested, the way you acted, the way you implemented your ideas, or did you try to remain consistent to your to your UBS days? It, uh, it, it didn't change my way of working. It didn't change the way uh, of taking risks and managing risks. Uh, what it did change was the awareness of risk. Because the awareness was I could not leave and just go to another job. Yep. If I fail with my own company, I fail. You see, uh, so the awareness of the risk of business failure um, uh, was different, very different, much higher awareness of risk in that sense. But the way I was working remained the same. I think now, quite a few years older, it's one step further and, uh, and, uh, and I would be much less risk taking yeah. today than I was then. But did, was it easy to instill, because you, your framework and the way you, 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 you make these decisions is very different to the way people are taught in university. You, you and I have that in common. You, you, you don't have that classical training that I think at times can be a burden on, on someone's career. Did you, did you struggle to try and bring people into your way of thinking? Did you have to break them first before you could get them to invest the way you wanted them to? Or were you in charge of nearly all the decisions at that point, and so they just had to follow you? Uh, I was basically always in charge of the decisions that were implemented. Um, in the l last few years, uh, my two uh, colleagues, uh, who I made partners, uh, then took over and became the driving force. But um, when you go back and check the numbers, uh, they played a different game than right. I did. And that's why I felt uncomfortable and wanted to leave. Um, no, until I called the shots and had the final word uh, to say, uh, I always felt comfortable. Because unlike in an industry where you make a business decision that lasts years and you cannot change it, in the financial markets, managing money, you can change immediately. Yeah, you, you can change to, yeah. quickly. And, uh, you know, my younger years were years as a trader. And then I worked from trading, I went to portfolio management. And then I had to take on 
with portfolio management research uh, functions and cap uh, capacities. Uh, so I worked backwards in my career. Right. Right. Most others start in research, go to portfolio management, and and uh, and, and go that way. You know, I work the other way around. I'm I'm a I'm a strange person in that sense, uh, uh, but, but that's my personality. When you listen to this stuff, it's it's fascinating because these big picture ideas, they they come along and they generally they they're embodied in a person. You know, people change this industry and people come along with new ideas and they shake things up and their track record proves them to have been successful. But to your point, at the time, they're seen, this, this is a very staid industry. If we think about money management, I guess as it has to be, people who are different and people who change things and want to change the status quo are, are difficult to deal with in, in yeah. finance. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm an easy person. Um, when I have an idea and I have thought it out very well, uh, I stick to the idea and then it takes a lot to convince me that uh, there are flaws and it's wrong and I have to reconsider it. I do reconsider it, but uh, you have to be very persuasive right. uh, to, to change my mind. But, but, yes. but, which is as it should be. You know, the, whole, the whole idea of, of, of these conversations that I'm having is, is to give people a chance to listen and learn from other people's experiences and other people's careers to try and you know, influence their own thinking and, and give them the ability to change that thinking without having to be beaten over the head by markets. Yeah, well, the point is in this business, at important turning points, you are always alone. Yes. You can be in the largest organization, whatever, you're always alone. Uh, and it's very nice and cozy to sit together with friends and uh, agree on something, This and you can hide and things like that. That's very nice. But at turning points, that doesn't work. At turning points, you are lonely. You're alone. And you have maybe this or that other friend or colleague you can talk about uh, the professional issues. And you ring them up, you call them and you debate. They do not tell you what to do. But it's important that you have just a few yeah. of those you can talk to who are understandable and who can tell you maybe you should reconsider this, or have you thought about that, etc. And then you do your homework once again and uh, then you come to the conclusion, no, it's all right, uh, you have to do it. But you are alone. Even your partners, etc., uh, they, do, they do not help you. Actually, they are sometimes a distraction. You, you kind of have to be. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, funnily enough, my last conversation with Tony Deaton, we talked about a similar experience he had in 1999 when the middle of dot-com craziness, and he, you know, he, he said, oh, this is wrong. But what he did was he called two of his trusted friends and they went away for a weekend and they locked themselves away in a, in a cabin in the woods or wherever it was and they sat down, the three of them, and they questioned every assumption that they made and they debated it. They talked it back and forwards um, and he said, you know, what was, what was remarkable to me, they came out of that and he said, okay, I now know that I'm right and everybody's wrong. And that kind of loneliness to, to, to feel, okay, I've, re I've checked my assumptions I run them past people I trust, and I think I'm right. That's yeah. when you have the courage to then say, okay, I am alone, but I have the confidence now yes. to do something about it. Yes, I, I can confirm it's very similar in my experience. I moved, uh, when I started my own company, I moved away from Zurich, where all the other guys but, are yeah. in money management. And I moved to the little town of Zug, which um, is a more provincial, international place, but provincial in size and where I was alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently a friend of mine started his own market letter business and he was all his life with a large bank. And he said, what is it like when I start my own? And I said, you will feel lonely, you know, but it has to be that way. Yeah. And I felt lonely, but that was not, I didn't consider it a burden, but sometimes you would like to have a friend, a colleague, helping you or holding your hand. Because you know from the markets when they get difficult, clients need you to hold their hand. Yes. And, and you as a decision maker, you always 
you, you at some point also need somebody to hold your hand. And, and most of the time at turning points, it's yourself yeah. holding your hand. And uh, you have to feel comfortable to be lonely because at important decision-making turning points in the market, you must be lonely. If you're not lonely and everybody agrees, it's not the turning point. So, so how do you choose those people? How do you choose the people that when you get to those turning points, okay, there's two phone calls I'm gonna make. How, how do you pick those people? Well, you have your uh, colleagues um, uh, over the years in business and you know how they are, you know them well. You know, you know the strengths and the weakness of the people and you do not call them up to tell you you're right or you're wrong. Yeah. You call them up that they hold your hand for a few minutes and, and the discussion with somebody uh, and throwing up that question or the other question just gets you back to the drawing board. You, do, you go over your homework again. They do not help you in the decision making. Mm -hmm. They help you as a person you like, you have faith in. Uh, it's more a human psychological help than a business decision making help. That's how I felt. So, so when, was, when was the last time you, you made one of those phone calls? What, what was the subject that you wanted to try and get some clarity around? Uh, I think that was in the decline uh, in, uh, in early 2009. Because I was looking for a bottom. And uh, a bottom is easier, by the way. It's much easier than a top. Uh, because a bottom is uh, a lot of fear. And fear expresses itself in, um, in a much clearer form yes. than greed. And, uh, and, 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 and I saw it coming. And I, I called uh, two or three friends and said, how do you feel and what do you see? And uh, have you thought about this? And, and we talked and chatted. And um, in an interview with Barons, I think it was March 9 or March 6, virtually one day off the low. <laughs> you did it again. Right. I, okay. I, I said there's going to be a big rally. I thought at that time it could, after that big rally, I said 25 to 40 percent in the next six months. Uh, I said it could go down to new lows because I was not sure about that. But at least that was a great opportunity for a six months time window. And so, so those conversations, what, what did you take from those at that time, March 09, was there anything that came out of those conversations specifically that you remember that made you make that big call? No, I think all those conversations uh, near turning points, all those conversations are much more uh, like a baby um, uh, looking out for the mother giving him some right. comfort. Right. You know, it's, it's, I think it's more that. It's more the psychological help that you are not as lonely as you feel right now. Right. You see? Well, it's, it's, it, it, interestingly enough, this, through this whole uh, rally, from, in fact, almost going back to 2009, I think people that I speak to have become increasingly lonely because they feel as though things have changed beyond anything they understand, beyond anything they've ever, any framework they've developed. And so you really have two choices. You either have the choice to feel lonely by sticking to what you believe to be the correct way that markets should function, or you completely give up your individuality and you, against your better judgment almost, you just throw yourself in with the crowd. And I've seen you know, people I have a great deal of respect for, market commentators, who I can see have just said, you know what, I give up. It's going up. I'm just going to have to go with this. And, and, and I may hate it. How, how do you deal with it? Because you don't strike me as someone who is ever going to give in and say, I'm just going to go with the crowd. You know, obviously, um, when the heat gets too hot, you have to leave the kitchen. Or in other words, you have to cut down on your risks. And uh, today, uh, for my uh, own capital, I run less risk than I used to run uh, during my heydays as a, um, as a hedge fund manager. Um, but at times, when I see, when I spot a very attractive opportunity, I can be very aggressive. But then it's a, a thing for a few months' time. Right now, I see that the whole world 
is agreeing on a view. Uh, and, and for instance, uh, the world is very bearish, the dollar, um, because it has declined uh, for uh, over a year. And, uh, and I think there is an opportunity for a great dollar rally coming. Uh, and and what, it will, what will trigger it is when the monetary situation in Asia, uh, the Asian dollar market, uh, the euro dollar market, and that has probably a lot to do with the repatriation of money of uh, US companies back to the US that will dry uh, those Asian and euro dollar market uh, of dollars. Uh, that there is going to be a shortage and those dollars uh, that are moved to the US do not come back and, and that could tighten the whole situation and, and I think that could be a great dollar rally. If it's not a great dollar rally but just a dollar rally, uh, then it will last just a few months and then it is a bounce in a secular downtrend. And uh, so the next rally uh, has uh, quite some importance to the big picture uh, because the currency is very important. Uh, currency flows show you what people are doing in the world with their money. You know, it's, it's very obvious. And, and, and the dollar peaking and commodities bottoming usually goes together. Yes. And the dollar peaked in early 17, uh, commodities bottomed in 16, and they went uh, in juxtaposition uh, trends. And uh, the current consensus is clearly uh, the world economy is accelerating. Uh, we are going into the late cycle stuff. Uh, inflation will go higher, bond yields will go higher, commodities will go higher, and the dollar will go down. The, it could turn out that way. Uh, right now, I feel even if it turns out that way, there will be a window of at least a few months where markets go in opposite direction, where yields will soften, where the dollar will rally, and where commodities will soften also, completely against the consensus. I feel it. It's not the big electricity I feel in my stock, but I feel it a bit, you know. And, and I hear it from my subscribers who come with questions. I can see where they stand and what bothers them. How do you play these? You mentioned options earlier on. Do, yeah. do you tend to take an options position first to, to, to give yourself some leeway? Or do you exclusively use options? How, how do you tend to play the turning no, points? I usually, I usually play um, the, the Forex markets uh, uh, first with a, uh, a forward contract, small size. And when I feel that uh, it's more comfortable, then I go bigger size and double up with options. So, so particularly in currencies, it's always the currency yes. markets first? The currency market um, uh, give you a lot of signs and usually the currency markets move ahead of all the other markets. Yeah, but they and they tend to move for a long time most of the time. They, tend they to are usually trend. trending, they are usually trending as the dollar has been trending down for uh, over a year. Um, and uh, when it turns, and we have a few of the technical non-confirmations, we could, over the next um, uh, two weeks or so, we could have some relapse of the dollar. It could happen uh, as uh, bond yield shoot up one more time uh, for two weeks or three weeks or so. Uh, but I don't think that 10-year uh, US Treasuries will decisively break uh, above the low 3% area, the level, the previous big high. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was in 13 or 14 or when it was. And, uh, and I think uh, it will fail, yields will fail at that level and the dollar will bottom near current levels, uh, particularly against Europe and EM currencies. Uh, I think dollar yen will be the last one to turn around. Uh, so I always check dollar yen because as long as dollar yen looks weak, I don't have to become aggressive yet. Okay. Once that turns, then I know I have to go full speed. Now, you, you mentioned, I'm going, thinking of your experiences back in the late 70s now, where we had a similar setup to this, an extended cycle, and then we did have that great commodity bull run. Uh, and, and to me, it feels like, I feel too that we're gonna get a strong rally in the dollar, but I think, I think that'll get squashed reasonably quickly, because I think it has to, it just causes too much pain. And then I see all this late cycle stuff you talked about happening back then, 
the commodity bull market. I, you know, I, I see that as how things are going to play out. Do, do, you, do you find yourself kind of juggling the two because your experience would seem to point you in one direction and, and that electricity would seem to point you in the other direction? How do you manage those two opposing? Well, you know, uh, this is an interesting situation because it leads up to tremendous opportunities and it's not decided which way it will go. Right. But if the dollar rallies, it tightens global liquidity. And depending on the degree of pain it creates, it could create trem tremendous pain with the high debt outstanding. You know, it's record levels of debt outstanding in the world economy. Uh, if it creates too much pain, then the central banks will relapse and ease. And if they go back and ease, then we have an extending cycle again. Then the dollar will weaken and decline. And then the commodity segment would rally and, and rise. And, and I think then that even stocks would rise again and go further than my current working hypothesis says. So uh, that's a, a question that comes up once the dollar rally is ending. Sure. Not now. The idea of prioritizing the preservation of what you have in down markets over maximizing gains in up markets has understandably disappeared from mainstream investing in recent years. But that is yet another pendulum which is bound to swing back in the opposite direction. Perhaps soon. But in the meantime, this recurring idea of identifying trusted advisors and getting them to help you check your assumptions has come up time and again in my conversations with legendary money managers. Hearing Felix talk through what he sees as the likely roadmap from here was absolutely fascinating to me, as it both confirmed and challenged my own beliefs. But before we dug deeper into that roadmap, I was keen to expand on how managing purely his own money has altered his perspective and perhaps changed the way he structures his portfolio. So act three of your story is you've moved to managing your own money, no, no client money. And I'm, I'm interested as to how that changes the way you look at markets, the way you look at risk, the way you look at how you construct your trades. Yeah, it has changed uh, uh, quite a bit because uh, obviously I have a limited lifespan and I want to preserve my capital and earn a decent return, but I don't have to increase my wealth uh, tremendously. So there is a different perspective. Uh, uh, the performance goals are more moderate and modest uh, than what they used to be. And uh, the way I do it is I have four pots. Uh, one is um, equities. I have a portfolio that is relatively stable for quite some time. A portfolio of fixed income investments, relatively stable. Portfolio of gold, uh, primarily physical gold that is stable and a portfolio of uh, commercial real estate, uh, primarily in Switzerland. And then I manage it by using overlays in the futures markets. So I could go up to 200% long, what I'm long already 100%, or I could go to net 100% short. That means minus 200% short uh, to make it uh, short 100% of what I own. Yeah. And that's, those are the limits in which I operate. And for the commercial real estate, it's basically when the cycle begins to turn down, I short the real, uh, the real estate stocks. Uh, so, you, so you hold on to the assets? You, yes, you hold I hold assets. on to the assets. I mean, occasionally I sell something uh, when right. there is an opportunity, but I'm not uh, interested to, um, uh, to trade the assets, the individual assets, a lot. Yeah. Uh, for many reasons, including tax reasons, etc. Uh, so that's why, that's how I operate, uh, and um, um, that means I operate a lot in the futures markets. Of course. And then, of course, I do currencies. I do currency overlays, and I speculate in currencies also. So how, do, how does it how does it change the way you view risk? As, as someone who's trying to manage to a time period now, how do you think about that as you as you construct these portfolios? Well, the main difference is that when uh, you run a business, uh, you have a continuous cash flow. Yeah. And that cash flow is very important when you run your own money also. 
because uh, whenever you make mistakes, the cash flow you can use to make up for the mistakes. When you are retired, you don't have the business cash flow. You have cash flow from your investments, but that is uh, much smaller than the cash flow from your business. So obviously that reduces the risk you want to take. Uh, and, and that's the main difference, really. That's the main difference. But uh, you know, the, the return, the safe return on capital is zero now. You know, so so providing, providing yourself with that income stream requires you necessarily to take risks you probably wouldn't ordinarily want to take. So do you, do you, look, to, do you look to minimize risks or do you look to, seeing as you have to take some risk, try and deploy that risk in a way that will maximize your returns? I have to take uh, some risk, of course. Um, no, no, I don't have to. Right. I have enough cash flow, I didn't have to take risk. But if I want to have a decent return, then I have to take some risk. And uh, most of the risk that I have been taking in recent years is in private debt. Um, I'm also chairman of a company where I was a founding partner. Uh, and uh, my son works there where we originate private debt and we manage private debt and I see the deal flow. Uh, and whenever I see something very attractive uh, coming by, I invest. Uh, and that increases the cash flow mm -hmm. uh, and is a very different cash flow return uh, from what the normal fixed income investment return would be these days. Yes. That's very different. You, know, you, you can make up to uh, 10%, whereas uh, the going rate in Switzerland is zero, virtually. But, but that requires something which seems to have vanished, which is research and due diligence and understanding a company's balance sheet and you know, doing the kind of work. Nowadays, people buy the, the, the junk bond ETF, which three words or four words that should never be put together, in, in, in my opinion. But so how do you go about researching the companies? Yeah, I, I have to do what uh, never used to be my love, uh, uh, analyzing companies. So I have to look at the company. I look at the balance sheet. Uh, I look at the business risks. Uh, I look at uh, how the industry in which it is positioned is performing, what the risks are there. So I do all that. I kick the tires, but I do not go and do um, uh, site visits. Site visits. Uh, the staff of the company uh, does that, of course. I don't do that. I do my own uh, plausibility type of uh, analysis, and that is uh, good enough. And uh, we will know the truth whether it is good enough in the next downturn. Right. Well, in exactly the next, right. The next economic downturn will show whether we uh, did our homework uh, properly or not. Well, I mean, look, either way, that will offer more opportunities. You know, we've spoken about these cycles that you've been through and I think in each cycle that you've identified over your 40 plus years in this business, there's been a main theme to it, whether it was inflation in the 70s, whether it was Japan or technology stocks uh, and now everything. What, what, what do you think this current cycle that we're in that we're kind of reaching possibly the end of, what's the driving force in that and how do you look at that in terms of where we are in the cycle? Well, the driving force uh, has been China in this cycle. That's where uh, more than half of global growth comes from and, and, and has been coming from in the current cycle. Uh, you know, without China, our growth rates uh, in Europe and in the US would be much, much lower. And, uh, and therefore, you have to analyze China, which is not an easy thing to do no. because uh, the numbers are flawed. We know that the numbers are flawed. Um, and when the, the, the time series that they show uh, begin to show uh, risks, all of a sudden they don't publish it anymore. Yes. So it's, it's, it's uh, difficult. But then you have to look beyond that. And uh, I think 2021 is the 100th anniversary of, uh, the, the, Communist Communist, of yeah. the Communist Party. Uh, 2000, uh, 2022 is the next uh, election of uh, the president of the country. Uh, so I assume that the current president, uh, who is now becoming president for a lifetime, he wants to have a good economy in 2122. Yep. If he wants to have a good economy then, he's, he's no dummy and, uh, and his experts aren't either. Uh, because I think actually uh, the Chinese government has the best experts of all the governments in, in the world. 
Uh, so they have to slow down uh, the pace of the economy in 1819 and reduce some of the risks they have built up. And, and I think you are seeing that already. Uh, the investment side of the economy is already slowing. Uh, the credit aggregates are uh, beginning to show a slowdown. Uh, you see that the real estate market is slowing down. Uh, prices are not rising anymore, etc. So you see that slowdown. And I think this has a tremendous effect on commodities. And therefore, the consensus that these very bullish commodities could be disappointed. Uh, uh, if they continue on that road. Uh, the bullish side on the Chinese economy is uh, that consumption is booming. Uh, the consumer boom is continuing. And uh, what has uh, been unnoticed by um, uh, the world and the analysts and observers, or most of them, is that the Chinese individuals have gone into debt deep, yes. deeply so. And uh, so they are becoming debt dependent as we are uh, in our economies. So you analyze uh, the Chinese economy. My hunch is that uh, uh, China is going to slow down the investment side and the production side of it. What happens to the uh, consumption side is a different story. We have to watch, we have to watch carefully. And we talked about uh, the dollar rally and, uh, and the correction in commodities before. Uh, if the dollar rallies beyond just a few months, let's say beyond three or four months, if it continues, then I think uh, the commodity uh, cycle bulls, uh, they could be in for some disappointment. Then uh, commodities could relapse and, uh, and the cycle would be restarted again in 2020 when the Chinese kickstart their economy yeah. again. So I think this is an important factor to monitor uh, what's happening in China, because it really dictates our cycle, our business cycle. But, but how, how do we think about that, given the fact that, uh, uh, to your point, that the world is kind of dependent upon Chinese growth right now. If they do pull back, uh, you know, because I, I, I get a sense that all these central banks everywhere now are into this so deep that they can't withdraw themselves from the process, because if they do, and they allow the market forces to, to reassert themselves, the general market forces are highly deflationary. Yes. So, so how, how do the Chinese, do you think, extricate themselves? And, and uh, I was recently in San Diego, and Louis Garve of GovCal gave a great presentation. He, he said exactly the same thing. He said, expect lower growth targets from the Chinese for the next few years that they might well miss to the downside. Yeah. Is the world ready for that? Are central banks ready for that? Well, the world is not ready for those disappointments that would come with it. Right. Uh, uh, but uh, I think this makes uh, for great opportunities in the marketplace uh, for people who have uh, enough contrarian genes. Uh, you know, right. I see I see lots of opportunities. Uh, so, so I, I think the Chinese will most likely over deliver in their restructuring efforts over the next two years compared to what the world expects. If that is true, then we will have a stronger dollar for longer and we will have weaker commodities for longer. But once the world then gets disappointed in 19 or whenever, they figure that out. Uh, the Chinese are beginning to kickstart their economy mm -hmm. uh, from, 19, from 2020 onwards. So. I think there are mini cycles within this long cycle that we are in. And the mini cycle, I think, is topping. When you look at the Citicorp uh, economic surprise yep. indices, you see it, uh, the world is slowing down. And, you know, European growth, if you analyze it, at least half of it comes from exports to China, mm -hmm. directly or indirectly. So if the Chinese slow down, uh, it affects them. And, of course, the same is true for the whole emerging market world. Sure. They are very dependent on China. Uh, so far, the Chinese are still buying a lot of consumer goods. The question is, when does the consumer begin to pull back in China? Um, uh, we don't know yet. But if, if, if we see that, then the risk on the downside uh, that we talked about uh, will grow much bigger. You know, I, when, when I look at this and I try and kind of navigate a path through it, 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 it feels 
almost impossible to get through this somehow, and yet, and yet we've managed to this far. But if China deliberately starts to slow down, to take some heat out of the economy, to give them more room to, to, to heat mm -hmm. it up again in a couple of years' time, I, I struggle to see a way that there's anybody left to pick up that slack. Well, I think the Chinese thought and think that the fiscal stimulus uh, in the US could take up some of the mm -hmm. slack. And, and I think it is timed that way, that when the US uh, pushes their economy a little bit further through the fiscal stimulus, that they could retreat some uh, and, and it would be balanced. O of course, it will not be balanced because China's effect uh, and impact on the world economy today is much bigger than the US economies. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think we are in for some disappointments. You know, that's my that's my case, uh, which I have uh, uh, written about and reported to my uh, subscribers in recent weeks. It was obvious that Felix had spent a lot of time thinking through the next four years from a macro level, but where did that send him in search of investment opportunities? Where do you see opportunity now? When you look around the world, I mean, we'll take private debt out for occasion. Which which regions of the world do you see opportunity in? I mean, you, I know I know you've got gold and cash, perhaps in larger amounts than you've had previously. Um, are there places that you look and think this is an investable opportunity, or, or are you really just watching for a, a moment to be able to step in? I think the biggest opportunity is in the dollar, uh, as I described before. I think the dollar could rally more strongly uh, and for longer than uh, the consensus believes. Uh, the, the positions in the forward market are short dollars. Yes. Uh, the sentiment is, um, is uh, depressed, not at an extreme right now because it started to bounce a little bit over the last two, three weeks. Uh, but if it relapses here for the next two weeks, I'm sure the sentiment numbers go down into a territory that I would consider bullish. Uh, so I think that's the best opportunity. Uh, the other opportunity I see is short uh, the base metals. Okay. Because that goes hand in hand with a stronger dollar. And particularly I think um, um, uh, copper, uh, which is very sensitive to the economy and to the investment uh, uh, side of the economy in China. Uh, would be uh, vulnerable here. I think copper, and, and the whole world and his brother is, is bullish on copper. So I think uh, uh, copper has a chance to surprise on the downside. Um, most other base metals also look like they have more to go on the downside. So I'm rather approaching base metals from the short side. Uh, those are opportunities. Then I think that uh, the equity markets will have another hit uh, before this uh, corrective process is over. Uh, and I think the European markets that are structurally the weakest, uh, probably due to the uh, creeping protectionism that I see on the rise and, and, and Europe is very dependent on exports, um, I think they are approaching a medium term oversold situation already. So if the euro begins to weaken, it could give uh, a trading bounce. Yeah. Uh, but I would call it a trading bounce, uh, more for trading than for investing. I would not invest in a big way in continental Europe because I think Europe is uh, messing up on all fronts. Uh, they are trying to put uh, the United States of Europe in place and the people do not want that. It's just a political no. and economic establishment. Uh, so there is a friction uh, between the people and uh, their leaders. Uh, there are many rifts going through the EU uh, in many different questions, and I think those rifts are growing wider. Uh, so I think Europe uh, politically is a powder keg, uh, and therefore I'm not interested to invest in a big way in European equities. Yeah. Uh, America is more attractive. Uh, I think uh, we are in a situation like in the early 70s where you had uh, the nifty 50s and uh, it's probably a handful of uh, 20, 20 stocks that still look very good. They have uh, intact trends. They made uh, new absolute highs, new relative highs. They are the stocks to own into these final 
game. You know, when we have a short-term correction, another hit to the markets, buy those stocks. And, and they are known, they are in the headlines uh, every day. This is not uh, uh, for long-term investors. Right. This is for the next medium-term trading move to the upside. But, you know, you compared this, the situation to the early 70s with the Nifty 50, which is interesting yeah. because the other, obviously the other big topic in the early 70s was inflation. And we're back there again. It's suddenly part of the conversation. And it seems to me, given the, the, the reactions that we've seen to stronger wage numbers, etc., that the market is on red alert for inflation uh, picking up again. Do you have any thoughts on inflation, whether you think it's back or are we still in a deflationary environment? Um, you know, inflation, Milton Friedman said inflation is a monetary phenomenon and we have a lot of monetary inflation and you see the inflation sky highs in, in, the, in the asset prices. Uh, the consumer price inflation is different. But if you use the, uh, the basket of 1980, for consumer price inflation in the US, you would now have 10% inflation, CPI. Uh, so they are changing the basket all the time. They are using funny numbers. They are making strange weightings. And you know all those consumer electronic gadgets uh, like smartphones, they have come down in price all the time. But you buy them once every few years, uh, and you don't buy them every month. Whereas your healthcare insurance and all that, you have to pay every month. So I think the numbers are flawed. We have more inflation that is shown. And uh, the central banks, by giving them a target of 2%, which is, comes out of ev right. anywhere, who, who knows uh, whether that is the right number. I think it's, it's, it's a dumb number. Um, uh, they just use it as a tool to remain asymmetrically easy in the cycle, you see. Uh, so I, I, I think we have more inflation than there is, but I do think that inflation will creep up. I don't think we have a big jump because the disruptors are still there and disrupting price. But the big change from previous years is coming out of Asia. The Asian prices of exported goods have been declining for years and years and years and years. That's over. Export prices out of Asia are rising. So it's not just that the deflationary influence of declining import prices in the Western world is gone. It has changed. It's now rising import prices. Mm -hmm. And import prices uh, make up about one third of the consumer price index. So I think this is a big change from the previous time. And eventually, particularly well, once the Chinese uh, begin to ease again and kickstart their economy, or even before, if our uh, authorities uh, uh, become uh, more stimulative, uh, we could have a surprise on the upside. Wages are rising in the U.S. Uh, between uh, two and a half to four percent, um, and particularly for professionals, for educated people. So I think the pressure is there. It's creeping. It's coming, and eventually we will break through. And then when we break through, maybe that's in 2019 or whenever. Then we break through the three percent level yeah. in ten-year treasuries. And once we break through there. It is not going to 320. Right. You know, then it goes to four. Yep. You know, then you will have a decisive move. And when you have a decisive move up in bond yields and rates, then you have a decisive move down in valuation mm -hmm. and equities. Basically. And that's something we haven't seen for nearly 40 yes. years now. Yes, yes. It's so coming. It's coming. It's a question of time. I think bond yields are in a secular bottoming process. Uh, I think we are. If, if you were a chartist, you would say you make a rounding bottom or some would say you make a reverse head and shoulder and we are building on the right hand shoulder a little bit further over the next six months or so. And once we break topside, all hell breaks loose. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, ha I have to agree that. And that's, I think that's the big danger because this, this every, if you look at right across every asset class, every country, it's all been built upon this 35-year bond bull market and this 35-year yeah. interest rate cycle. And if, if you're right, as I, as I suspect and fear you are, 
that we are in a bottoming process, yes. then that's a problem. I don't see that as a danger. I see that as an opportunity, opportunity. actually. Of course. You know, then I will be short bonds and I will be short equities at that time. Sadly, my time with Felix was drawing to a close. But before I left him, I wanted to ask him just one more question. Well, look, before we wrap up, I just want to I just want to get from you, if I can, just some of when you look back over your career, some of the big lessons that you've learned. And generally those happen the hard way. You know, the, the things happen that you didn't see coming. And I'm just curious to get a couple of situations throughout your career where you didn't make the call at the right time or you made the wrong call at the wrong time and, and how you handled the adversity of it and how you kind of factored that into your thinking going forward and helped change the way you look at things. Well, the worst mistakes were um, in the early years. Of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, early in the learning curve. Uh, I think the most extreme case was when I uh, tried to be smarter than the smart market. And I tried to outsmart the market. And it was in, in silver in uh, 1980. Uh, I saw the peaking of silver. I, um, I uh, thought it, it, it has peaked at that time. And then it started to decline. And uh, when it hit from 50 down to 36, I thought uh, we now have a bounce back yep. to 45. And I bought as a trader against the primary trend after the turn and thought I, you know, I was uh, 30 years old uh, and I thought I could be smarter than the market. And uh, I, I watched silver prices going down, 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 and at 18, I liquidated. It was within days. Uh, I liquidated. I had turned the monitors off. I couldn't stand it anymore. Yeah. Uh, that was terrible. And for days, I couldn't look at any monitor anymore. Uh, it was uh, pretty devastating. And uh, then I went back to the drawing board, did my um, analysis, and uh, then came to the conclusion it probably goes down to 10 to 12, that area. And I remember <clears throat> when it approached that zone, I had to go to the military service because Swiss yeah. had to do their military duties. And uh, it really um, uh, was the reason why I asked my commander to be in the office instead in the field, <laughs> that I can be close to a telephone. Because in those times, we didn't have uh, 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 mobile yeah, cellular sure. phones, you know. So I was in the office and, and I was building the position during my military service uh, between 10 and 12, a long position. And I bought about three times as much as I had owned before. And, uh, and then I expected a rally for several months and I was in San Francisco, actually. I think it was September of that year. I'm not sure whether it was 81 or 82, uh, September of that year. And I saw the Wall Street Journal, the print, uh, $23, silver, $23. And I, I couldn't call my office because it was closed. So I stayed up until midnight when they opened uh, the bank in, in Switzerland and I said, sell, sell my whole position. <laughs> so I finally made some profit out of it, but it was, oh my, you know, that was really painful. And, and, was how, painful. But, and how did that, you know, after, after suffering through that experience, yeah. how did that change you? Well, first of all, uh, I tried to not outsmart the market in that sense. You know, being cute, going against the primary trend is not really clever. Yeah. Th that is dumb, actually. And I think it was a dumb thing I did because I thought I understand uh, the character of the market better than others. It was really dumb. Uh, so I paid dearly. Um, uh, th that was probably my worst experience. And from then on, I tried to convince myself whenever I entered a trade, to not go against the primary trend. Trade against it, but small, yeah. not big. Um, and that worked out, that worked out well. But, uh, you know, I had, uh, I had other losses. I had a big, I remember um, that was uh, just after we were married and back in Switzerland and my wife and I, we uh, rode together in the car to work to Zurich. And uh, 
in two weeks' time, I lost a lot of money in foreign exchange trading. At that time, it was a lot of money. Uh, today, it wouldn't, but at that time, it was a lot of money. And, uh, and I said to my wife, she was driving, uh, because I usually read uh, right. research stuff next to her. And I said, we, we lost some money. Uh, and uh, she said, uh, how much did you lose? I said, well, an annual income. And then she said, yours or mine? <laughs> and I said, both. <laughs> so, so uh, and then it was quiet for a while. She was quiet for a while. And then she said, you know, we want to have a family. And for that, we need some money. I trust you do the right thing, but please keep that in mind. And that put, put the ball back into my court. You know, you better watch out. Do your risk management. So... Risk management has always been important to me. <laughs> you know, and, it, and it starts and begins with husband and wife. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Felix, look, we, we, we've, we've come to the end of the conversation. It's been so much fun and so educational. I can't thank you enough for, for taking the time to do this with you. It's been such a thrill. Thank you for having me, Grant. It has been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I've looked forward to meeting Felix Zula for almost a decade since first making his acquaintance via email and the day I spent with him in Naples certainly didn't disappoint. Felix is gracious and charming, sharp and insightful and listening to him talk about the big calls he's made over the years and the way his framework has developed was a rare opportunity to get inside the mind of a true investing legend. I couldn't help but wonder whether the ability Felix had to follow his gut instinct in such a profound way has gone forever even amongst the true giants of the industry, or whether it was just another pendulum which had reached the extent of its arc. But there was one word I found rattling around in my head more than any other, opportunity. Felix saw every market dislocation as an opportunity to be taken advantage of, and that mindset had helped him forge the kind of career that so few are able to achieve. For me, that simple thought was a reminder of my own mindset early in my career. A mindset which, somewhere along the way, had perhaps dimmed a little, but which I knew I had to try and find a way back to. And as I watched the sun disappear below the horizon, I couldn't help but think just how difficult that simple thing has become. Thank you for watching this interview. This is just a taste of what we do at Real Vision. To learn more about the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy, click on the membership link in the description. Give us seven days to change your life. This will be the best dollar you ever invest.